I can play that video I was going to play for them from, it's a clip from um, Thursday night. Yeah. And we can talk about that because then I, I'll be recording that and I can possibly use that, some of that for the. Um, Unmanned Thursday. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play it. It's about six or seven minutes long. Okay. Here it comes. In the newsletter this week, if you got it, I ask you all to um, be thinking about the answer to a question. And you know, I ask the atheist uh, quite often, and I've heard atheists, other people ask atheists on uh, the shows that I watch on YouTube. They'll ask them the question, do you ever ponder the possibility of God? Because when you get right down to it, most human beings, I think it's a quite natural thing to do, for all of us to ponder that greater, something that's greater than ourselves, a greater power than ourselves. Something is much bigger than ourselves. And some uh, within religion think about that power of creating the earth or creating human beings and, and being a creator. Some people have a worldview concerning that, that being as being someone who um, watches over us and, and loves us and tries to help us through life. Others have a, a worldview of someone who uh, rewards us when we do well and punishes us when we do poorly. Um, there's all kinds of worldviews concerning God. As a matter of fact, in seminary, there's one whole section of uh, the Christian ethics class in which you study those worldviews about just how do you look at the idea of God. Well, atheists get asked all the time, do you ever ponder the possibility of God? And they're, and they're most of the more thinking atheists, the intelligent atheists, they will say, well, of course I do. Um, I am saying that, um, the, the atheist says, I am saying that I don't believe in God, but I don't know for sure, and there could be a God. I'm not saying that there is no God or that I know there's no God. I'm just saying that in my life, I have not seen enough evidence to think and to become to believe that there is a God. And so that's the way the atheist looks at it. But when you turn it right back around, then the question I like to ask my Christian friends, because that's where I primarily operate, is among Christians, is, is it possible, and this was in the newsletter, is it possible that Jesus was a simple man with a well-articulated message about a better life, how to build a better life, without any supernatural element to him or to his wisdom. So, and that's hard for us to think about. We want the atheist to say to us, um, yes, I ponder God. Yes, I wonder if there's a God. Uh, even though I don't believe there's a God, I have to wonder if there's a God. And, and uh, but I don't know that there's no God, but I have not come to believe there is a God. That's the atheist position. Most of the, of the thinking kind of atheists, the atheists that have intelligence to realize it's nearly impossible to say I know for a fact anything about anything that's supernatural. And, uh, and that's just the way it is. So, and if we ever discover a way through science to prove that there is a God there, if you want to call it God, or Theos, or a just simply a higher power, something larger than ourselves, something bigger than us. If there's some way to prove that, then once we prove that, guess what? Now God becomes part of the natural world. Now God is part of natural science because we're saying 
that's if at that point that science has proving proven that this higher power is really there and some people call it god some people call it something else but nonetheless it now becomes part of the natural world because it no longer defies the laws of logic as it does now it no longer it no longer works outside the boundaries of the the natural laws of nature um, that science works by and tries to prove things by but now all of a sudden it's it's part of our knowledge now that's an interesting concept when you think about it and i'm not saying that day could never come because it could it could and it could not but then when you get to the matter of jesus you start asking yourself all right is it possible that Jesus was a simple man with a well-articulated message about how to build a better life without any supernatural element to him or his wisdom? Now, is, if the atheist is willing to say, yes, I ponder a God, I wonder if there is a God, then why can't the Christian say, I ponder all of this stuff those ancient writers wrote long after Jesus died, explaining all this supernatural stuff, I wonder if it's true or if it's not. And I, I just think as, a, as human beings, we need to ponder and question when it comes to supernatural thoughts and beliefs on either side of the atheist or theist debate. And I know the church teaches us not to question, to be strong in your faith, you know? Be strong in your, I've taught that, be strong in your faith, all right? But is it faith Think about this for a minute and just really put your mind into this one because this one's important. Is it faith if you're sure? If I know for a fact that those miracles are true, if I know for a fact that that supernatural acts are true, if I know for a fact walking on water and making water into wine and raising someone from the dead and healing someone of, of uh, leprosy or healing someone from being lame or blind or whatever, I know for a fact those things are true. Now, is there any faith if you're sure? Faith is the belief in something that you have not seen, Paul said, that you cannot sense with your five senses. So if you're sure, is it faith? Think about that. So have you ever thought, I'll say the, I'll say the question again, is it possible that Jesus was a simple man with a well-articulated message about a better life without any supernatural element to him or his, to his wisdom. Pretty in interesting question when you think about it. What do you think about that fact that if, if the atheists are willing to say, um, I cannot be certain there is no God, I cannot say that I have the knowledge there is no God, absolute knowledge there is no God, and I, and I um, don't know the answer to that, but I have not yet come to believe that there is a God because the evidence has not been presented to me that would cause me to believe there is a God. If the atheist can do that, then what does it say about Christianity if we say that we have an exclusive situation in which we are absolutely sure and that everybody else um, is going to suffer eternal punishment because they have not believed as we believe. I think I don't know that much about atheists. I know you have studied them extensively and listened to them um, on every degree of atheism that there is. Uh, but and I guess there are also degrees of Christian people who are open-minded and people who are closed-minded. Uh, and I think the people who are closed-minded in both camps are closed-minded and you're not going to be able to affect anything they think or process. Those who are open-minded uh, are the only ones who can be affected by any kind of questions uh, or would be willing to ask themselves internally any questions. Uh, either you've got an open mind or a closed mind. And you're pretty much stuck. 
one way or the other until you open your mind. And I don't know and know what it took for us to open our minds to other possibilities. And it was a pretty um, significant bump in our road that caused us to be open-minded about all kinds of things, not just Christianity and all that, but uh, general behavior of people. And, uh, just knowing that it's not our job to judge people or to judge things. Uh, that we don't have the capability to understand everything. And that's the bottom line at this point, as far as my life's concerned, is I don't know. And there's no way for me to find out. I mean, I guess I could do more research, but that just opens more questions. So it, the bottom line is I don't know. And I'm not going to hold anybody else to the measure of what they do or don't know because uh, I think they don't know. So... I think they should be willing to ask those questions, yes. Uh, I don't know that most Christians, that at least the ones we have interaction with on a limited basis, are willing to ask that question, much less answer it for themselves. Well, why is it, why is it that, um, or let's put it this way, instead of, instead of making a statement about it, let me just ask you your, your opinion of it, and that is, do you think that Christians in their lives would benefit uh, as greatly or more so um, if they followed the teachings of Jesus but gave up all the supernatural uh, rituals and all the supernatural beliefs, all the supernatural um, miracles, uh, all the healings, uh, if they gave up the um, the idea that um, they are born evil and that the only way that they can escape the punishment for that evil is that, that someone was tortured and killed 2,000 years ago, um, would Christians' lives, I'm not talking about the afterlife because I don't believe in an afterlife, but would Christians' lives be benefited in a greater way if they simply followed the teachings of Jesus um, as we articulate them uh, in the way to be? But would they would they somehow benefit greater by putting their focus there and taking their focus off of this exclusive salvation from hell, salvation to heaven, um, rescued from their own sins approach to the point that what is good uh, is coming after they die and that life itself uh, is just something you got to get through uh, it, it, what do you think about what do you think about uh, about that let me put this on another camera shot so I can see you better there we go so what do you th what do you think I think if we all took the teachings of Jesus and lived by them, um, we would all be better off. We would all learn the, the, the truth that uh, what goes around comes around. If you treat people nice, they'll treat you nice. If you try to take a, a, a you know the optimistic view of any person's comments or attitudes or actions toward you and you turn them around and you, you don't hold grudges and, and all that kind of, I think all that would make you have a more peaceful, better life because that's what I do. That's what I've done uh, most of the time. I can't do it all the time. Sometimes I get my feelings hurt and sometimes I want to hurt other people's feelings back and that's not the way I was meant to be, taught to be, and that's not the way I'm the most at peace. If I try to figure out ways to get back or if I hold grudges it causes me problems it doesn't affect the other person one little bit and that's unactionable and it's silly and if I stop and think about it and I calm down and I think you know that's them I don't have to be them I, I have to be me I have to do what I feel I'm supposed to do uh, at the same time most of the stuff all that other is ingrained in us and it's hard to let go of it um, 
And, and, and the bottom line, again, is like I said a while ago, is I don't know. And it doesn't matter. When I'm dead, I'm dead. I'm gone. Um, I don't have interaction with other people. Other people don't have interaction with me. And, you know, if, if I don't, as long as I'm not burning in hell, if there's not one, there's not the other. So I'm fine. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It's unimportant. And what and it seems like a waste. A waste of many, 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 many lives of waiting for heaven. When you should be tending to each other in such a way that present lives are enhanced and encouraged and more productive. Well, you know, we, we've served enough churches in Indiana and New England and Tennessee and, and here in Florida um, that it's more than evident that these principles that Jesus taught, and we're in this Way to Be series right now, these principles that Jesus taught uh, related to having this humility before, uh, recurs concerning anything you think you know spiritually, that is your knowledge of, of spiritual things is, is limited and you're humble about that, you don't know all about spiritual things as opposed to being, as I like to say, all that in a spiritual bag of chips you realize that you're in the same place everyone else is in. And this humility that you're supposed to have toward one another, instead of mourning your own con instead of mourning your own condition, we tend to mourn the condition of everyone else. We know what's wrong with everyone else, or as Granddaddy used to say, um, you know, everybody's uh, crazy but you and me, and, and I worry about you most of the time. Well, um, Jesus taught, you know, blessed are those who mourn, Mourn what? They mourn their own condition. They mourn their own um, shortcomings, their own inability, um, and that um, you know that brings them to a place of being able to operate in society. So, in essence, its first two beatitudes, as religion likes to call them, are, are um, blessed are those who are humble about uh, eternal things. Um, and the separate, the second one is blessed are those who are humble about temporal things, uh, things in this world. And then, and then he says, um, uh, blessed are those who are gentle. Um, they'll appreciate, you know, whatever they, whatever they have, whatever they succeed, whatever comes their way, uh, they will inherit the earth, that what there is of the earth to inherit for them. But, um, that we, we've come to realize that all of that and, and, and the merciful that receive mercy, that we don't respond in kind and therefore we don't get responded to in kind less often. We, um, we uh, hunger and thirst for righteousness. We don't think we're full of it. Um, we, um, we try to have motives that are pure toward other people and not be motives that are simply self-centered and we use other people and manipulate other people. Um, and we try to make peace between every two person and don't use uh, sowing dissension among people as a tool, as a manipulative tool that gets us what we want. All of that we've seen in the church uh, basically backfire. Uh, we've seen, and, and you know, when Jesus said, judge not lest ye be judged by the same measurement with you judge, we see what goes around does come around, and basically the church tends to be one big continuous cycle of just exactly that over yeah. and over and over and the, the fighting and the feuding and the struggling over power and, and all those kinds of things. So that when I entered seminary, that's what got me onto this idea of the way to be. In other words, what is the contiguous line of thought of Jesus? What was it likely to have been like based upon what is said in the ancient writings? And then toss out the supernatural because if supernatural things didn't happen, then Jesus didn't walk on water. He would have sunk up to his eyebrows like all the rest of us. And so um, if you let all that cast aside, then his following did not develop from following a man who was running around doing supernatural stunts. But instead, it, it developed from someone who was teaching some wisdom that was causing them to be set free from the religion of their day which kept them feeling guilty and captive and co constantly having to kowtow to the scribes and Pharisees and to the temple 
um, those were things that Jesus was trying to say, you can be released from that, that you have the capacity within yourself. There is a way of being that will cause you to be more content in life. So we've seen that in the churches that we've served. I know I certainly, as a pastor, have seen it over and over and over again, that there are always people, not very many, but always people in the church that have this way about them. There are always people in the church who, who seem to be the emotional, uh, relational gyroscopes that everybody looks to when crisis comes. And the reason is, is because their visceral response to all of it was already made long before it started to happen. They are able to respond in a way that represents who they already are inside. And to me, that is what Jesus was talking about. How do we mold and make ourselves? There came the context again, so I thought I'd better bring the other screen back up. Um, oh, this is what was happening that time. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what it was. I think the thing yeah, that has been the biggest paradigm shift for me yeah. in, in the things that you have shared that you have studied is that contiguous line of thought is the fact that Jesus wasn't just, you know, making sound bites. Uh, yeah, he, he wasn't. He wasn't Will Rogers running around went, and doing snippets. He went all the way through the whole spectrum right. at one point, and he didn't use it as fifteen-minute sermonettes over a lifetime. Right. Uh, he had this plan. At least that's the way it's been reported, from from start all the way around. Right. And since none of that included the supernatural uh, hocus pocus anything uh, it kind of makes you doubt what everybody else did with his word right and there's been I, there's been a lot of people who have speculated about that the people that I've that I try to listen to um, on other uh, internet uh, shows where they talk about theological issues and so forth there are many of them and they try to talk about, and one of them in particular, there's a guy out there named Bob Graves, and Bob talks about a God that was, it's because I've never heard him before until the last few months, um, but he's a guy, he and I sound a lot alike. In other words, what we're talking about is that following a Jesus who actually came to set us free from all this religious nonsense free from this God of, of violence that was represented in the Old Testament and, and um, to think about our lives from the standpoint of what did what Jesus had to say, what does it mean to us in living our lives? One of the things that I've been trying to promote a lot is that everybody thinks that they're going to solve this issue, this great debate over whether or not there's a God in this great debate over whether or not Jesus was supernatural or not in this great debate over the Son of God question and all of that and then the historicity of Jesus and, and all of that that all of that's the important part of the debate and and I'm not trying to prove anything from ancient literature and ancient writings from 2,000 years ago or from 6,000 years ago or 10,000 years ago what I am trying to do is to say that if that contiguous line of thought, which appears to be still enough of it there for it to be most likely to be what Jesus taught, that that contiguous line of thought about how to be content in life, how to live in this life and be able to take on the struggles that come your way and take on the incoming that comes your way and both be satisfied with what you receive and at the same time not be uh, destroyed by the disasters that happen or, you know, hurricanes and floods and so forth not be not be torn all to pieces because someone constantly gets in your face or criticizes you or or you get fired from a job or somebody else gets the promotion or whatever it happens to be but that all of that all of that contentment all that way of being that Jesus taught and then his contiguous line of thought all of that way of being is is can be proven in the 21st century it can be proven in August of 2015 if we will allow it to be. Uh, and the reason for that is, is if we internalize ourselves the contiguous line of thought of Jesus, that way of being that he talked about uh, throughout the Gospels, that, that, that not he talked about, but that the writers let leak in throughout the Gospels and leave off all the rest of this stuff where they were serving their own purposes. 
just like everybody else that's ever been involved in religion, all of the writers were serving their own purposes. But if you can internalize that and, and try it out for yourself, and you discover that, yes, indeed, that does make me more resilient and more content in life. Something you said a while ago is that sometimes you feel like getting them back. Um, I can honestly say, and I know it's hard, because I had a temper as a kid, but I can honestly say I lost the need to get someone back some time ago. Uh, it doesn't even feel good anymore. And I and I still take on, as you well know, quite a bit of crap from people sometimes because of my cultural circumstances in life. But for some reason or another, it's gotten easier and easier and easier to say that's on them. Whatever's going on in their mind, whatever it is makes them think that they have a, a license to act that way or talk that way or treat me that way or say those kinds of things to me, um, whatever they have going on inside of them, that's on them. That's their stuff. Um, the biggest, biggest, uh, I guess, elephant in the room, mm -hmm. uh, standing between Christianity being able to say, yeah, no mind, I don't think about that, is that great big, huge inerrancy problem. Yeah, issue. yeah, and that's that's probably one of the one of the really great things that we could talk about is. We talked about it here. I don't think you were on that Sunday, but we talked about that here in the in, in my living room. We uh, when we had our private group meeting, we talked about the fact that um, Christians really do not. If, if you want to get down to the core of what they believe, okay, they really do not believe in Jesus. They really do not believe in God. Okay. There is a linchpin in all this. There is a core element of all of this that without it, belief in Jesus and belief in God and belief in even thinking about the concept themselves would all be gone. Do you know what that is? Inerrancy. You just said it. The Bible. The Bible. If you didn't believe in the inspired, inerrant, perfectly consistent Word of God, if you didn't believe that that book, that compilation of ancient writings, which... Um, the, the compilation that we have today could not possibly be the compilation that, that existed in the, in the millenniums that have gone by. Because we have but 50, they don't believe that either. Well, we have over, we have over 5,700 manuscripts, and there's over a quarter of a million uh, over a quarter million dollars, over a quarter of million variances between those manuscripts. Now, yeah, some of them is spelling, some of it is skipping a word, some of it is little things. But some of it's significant, too, and you can actually see in some of those variances as the one who was copying it was trying to grind their axe. They were trying to make their point. They were trying to get the Christian religion to go in their direction, their thoughts, just like the writers themselves. Then you add on top of that is the oldest fragment that we have is about the size of a credit card from the first half of the second century, okay, over a hundred years I after Jesus died, you, you simply, you cannot possibly think that we have anything that's authentic. They don't believe that either. Uh, well, they, yeah, they, they do at this point. No. The major, sure. yes, they do. A yes, average church the person member. in the pew. An average church member does not. An average church member will just, they believe by blind, here's what I've been taught and it has to be true. But if you talk to any biblical scholar, even a conservative fundamentalist biblical scholar, they will tell you, we have these manuscripts. Those variances exist. Those are not the names of the gospel writers. Uh, most all scholars will tell you that, that those, those names were applied later on. They will tell you we have no original. We don't have anything from the first century at all. And we cer certainly don't have anything at all <coughs> from when Jesus was living. Uh, nothing, period. The, the, uh, er the person early in the pew doesn't believe any of that. And if the person that they idolize, and there's always some leader that they idolize, and their their comprehension of and belief of the Bible goes through that human first person, it's like a, a Charles Stanley or or whoever it is. No, I understand um, that, but see, but you're right back. You're right back to what I was saying. The point that I'm making is this: is that if that if that 
domino fell. Yeah. Then it all falls. Yeah, but it doesn't fall. It expires. Right. So what is what what is my motive? What is my motive? Well, my motive is that I love Christian people. I've served Christian churches and lots of them. I've been teaching the Bible since I was a teenager, and I'm 64 years old now. So what is my extra grind? My extra grind is this, and that is I believe that within the contiguous line of thought of Jesus, in other words, if you read those ancient writings, it does sound like Jesus had a message. He had a axe to grind himself. He had something that he was trying to get them to see. And, and I think that what we talk about at Way to Be is, way, the way to be is exactly what he got them to see, what he tried to get them to see. And they were called, they were called people of the way. These followers of Jesus were called people of the way. They're identified in the scripture as such. So yeah, I my ex, huh? I, I, I know that. Right. My extra ground is simple. I believe there is plenty, the very best of what is to be offered by Jesus and his life and his teachings, like so many other teachers throughout the history. The very best of it, the very best of Christianity is that teaching. Everything has ever been done good and there's a lot's been good done good by Christianity, and a lot's been done bad. All the wars, and all of the treatment of people, and all the, the polarization of people, and, and all the cultural differences that have been put down, and all the human rights that have been denied, and all that. But then at the same time, all the people that's been fed, all the people that's been loved, all the people that's been cared for, all the people that's, that's been, been visited in the hospital, and, and so forth. There are good things that come out of Christianity, but all that good you have to point back to what? Walking on water? No. You point back to the teachings every time. Yeah. All of the good that's come out of Christianity, you point back to the teachings. All of the horrible and the violence and the, and the um, prejudice and the bias and the discrimination that has come out of Christianity, you point right back at these supernatural beliefs that uh, my God wouldn't like you. My God uh, this is what my God says, and if you don't believe that, then you're doomed to hell. And that sort that just of makes it all politics, right? But my point is, is that that's the linchpin. So when I talk to him here, it it simply came down to this, and that is that you don't believe in Jesus, you don't believe in the resurrection, you don't believe in God, you don't believe in any of those things, you know. From Moses to Abraham to Paul to whoever, you don't believe in those things until you first believe in this inerrant, inspired book that was put together by human beings. Right. So that's the linchpin. That is the linchpin. That one book is probably the, the most in, uh, influential element on the face of the earth. What proof do we have that God said write all this stuff down and make it a Bible? Because the Bible says so. Right. <laughs> See, I mean, that's that's it. It's all you can do. You can only go round and round and round. That's right. It, this, it has to be circular because um, there's no other way to do it. There's nothing that points from outside, inside, to say that, all right, right. except for the Christian religion. So if, if you... If you um, you can't argue over... And that's the reason they call it faith, Okay. Yeah. Faith is faith. Okay, you can't prove God exists. You can't disprove any negative. I can't prove that there's not a chicken outside the door of my study that you're sitting in right now. There's a chicken in the hall. I can't prove there's a chicken in the... I can't prove that... You cannot prove to me that there's not a chicken in the hall. But you can get up and open that door, and if ain't no chicken, ain't no chicken. Right? The door's open. <laughs> okay, but you get my point. Just saying. Right. So... Yeah. So you can't you prove. You can state anything. You can right. have faith that it's true. You can't but prove. It doesn't make it true. You can't prove a negative. So you cannot prove that God does not exist. You also, though, but you can't prove that God does exist, and you can't prove that Jesus was the Son of God. You can't prove. You can't even prove historically that he was crucified. You can prove historically that people were crucified. But normally when they were crucified, they were not put in a rich man's tomb. That was a pretty unusual part of the story, okay? Uh, so my point, is, my point is simple, is that um, 
the question that we began with before we ran all these rabbits is this. Is it possible that Jesus was a simple man, well articulated, a well articulated man who taught how to build a better life and there was nothing supernatural about him or his teachings? And that's the, that's the question. That's an important question. And uh, when I did the sermon on the hay, and I think I may play the sermon on the hay in this um, in this recorded thing that we're going to do for Thursday night, because uh, I'm going to be out of town. The, the thing is about it is when I did the sermon on the hay, what I did was I simply wrote and then acted out what, as a farmer, in a, far, in a farmer's market, acted out what would a farmer sound like if he gave up on religion but a southern farmer who gave up on religion, obviously, like me, 60-something years old, who's been raised in it, but gave up on it, what would he sound like? Well, all of what Jesus taught about the way would be there. And that Sermon on the Hay is simply a parody. And I followed right straight through, without any uh, exclusions, the Sermon on the Mount. setting. I wondered, if a southern farmer raised in the rural church gave up religion altogether, what would he say to his neighbors? I call it the Sermon on the Hay. Everyone knows the bananas are not homegrown in Tennessee, but somehow they taste better coming from the farmer's market. My grandmother takes me often. Folks from town wander, each searching, feeling, and smelling for the perfect produce. Mason jars or preserves have ring lids clamping down a gasket cap. As I walk along the narrow aisles, blowflies pester me. The mixed smells of some ripe and some already rotting fruit permeate the air. More is buzzing about the market this morning than the blowflies. Most everyone seems to be at the other end. Curious about what is going on, my grandmother says, let's go see. When we draw near, we find that everyone is watching a young farmer. He has on bib overalls, a plaid shirt, and a straw hat. The young man is not saying anything, just wandering around, occasionally picking up produce, squeezing, sniffing. He weighs it in the palm of his hand. A few sellers abandon their stations to join the growing group. Some appear to know who he is. Who is that, my grandmother asked a man in a yard chair. His name is Tuck. He's been talking all around town. My boy and I heard him in front of the hardware the other day. He really has something to say. He makes a lot of sense. Eventually, Tuck sat down on a bale of hay. Someone turned off the farm report. One by one, everyone noticed him sitting there, his legs swinging. The market noise ceased. We could hear nothing but the creak of wooden beams overhead, struggling against their joints. The young man pushed back the brim of his straw hat, revealing his eyes. We could see he was struggling for words. With a worried look, he pressed his lips together and exhaled a burst of air through his nose, as if he had no right to speak. Finally, he began. We could all be content, you know. Folks seem to be the most content when they know nothing at all, especially about spiritual things. We are more content when we measure our own condition, not somebody else's. Everybody's strange except for you and me, and I worry about you most of the time. If we could be gentle with one another, we would appreciate what we receive without taking it away from each other. If we really want to know what's right, we could be content with the fact we never really know it all. Certainly not enough to go around saying what's right for others. When we respond in kind less often, Others respond to us in kind less often. We could even be content to offer charity for the wrong others do to us. We are most content when we shuck each other's peas, even if our own beans are waiting. Whatever else we desire, we should want peace between each other. That makes everybody more content. It's the way we want to be remembered. What if we had this way about us? Each of us would be a gift to others. 
We'd be refuge for those who seek shelter in us. We'd be a bright spot in everybody's darkness. The result would be, because of us, this way of being would be real to others. Everybody would be thankful for you and me if we had this way about us. Now, don't hear me trying to tear down your religion. I don't want to do that. Instead, I want to talk with you a few moments about a better way, a way of being that is fuller and richer than religion. Those who do their best at religion may be good folks, but did you know those who do their worst at religion might be good folks too? Even so, I'm telling you, unless you do better than religion, you'll never really be at peace inside. This way I'm talking about is a way of being, not a way of doing. It's a journey on the inside of you. It's not a way to go through religious motions or keep some religious law forbidding some action. Let me give you a few examples. You know it's illegal to murder somebody. You heard it all your life. What if you manage your anger? Would you ever purposely kill another person? First you get angry, then you call names, and before you know it, somebody gets hurt. Just make friends as quickly as you can of anyone with whom you may be angry and with anyone who may be angry with you. Remain at peace and stay out of court. Don't be angry. If you have this way about you, your actions can naturally follow your attitude. You'll be more content. I'm sure you know you shouldn't cheat on your spouse. What if you did not yearn after someone else? Would you look at another? Looking leads to touching. Touching leads to cheating. You wind up with no spouse at all. Just keep the promise you made to your family. Don't be lustful. If you have this way about you, your actions can naturally follow your attitude. You'll be more content. Religion teaches you to love everybody, while at the same time telling you who the bad folks are. Bad folks are the ones you don't like and who don't like you. You say you love everybody? If you do, you'll bend over backwards to not take offense and to accommodate whoever wants from you. You'll do so most of all for the ones who don't like you and for the ones you don't like. Just love every other person. If you have this way about you, your actions can naturally follow your attitude. You'll be more content. Don't do what you do to please religion. Do it because you're a genuine person. What you do and say should be the result of the way you are inside. If you want to be seen and heard, you have it backwards. It will not make you content. Let me share with you a few examples of just pleasing religion. When the offering plate goes around, good folks put something in it, right? What if you gave it some other time, such that none of your friends knew about it? What if some of your gifts are outside of religion? Making a show to be seen is just given to get. That's not genuine. Making a show to be seen is taking, not giving. If you have this way about you, your actions can naturally follow your attitude. Give quietly. You will be rewarded with contentment. The most reverent, righteous, and religious are those who know the loftiest words to pray, right? What if your prayers were private? None of your friends would hear you. Isn't that as it should be? Are you praying to be heard by your friends? There really is no need to pray in public or to repeat the same words over and over. There's a more humble way to pray. If you have this way about you, your actions can naturally follow your attitude. Pray quietly. You will be rewarded with contentment. Good religious folks sacrifice themselves, don't they? What if no one knew about your sacrifices? If you get up your neighbor's hay one evening, don't tell everybody up and down the road about it. Don't show up for dinner all hot and sweaty either. Shower and wear clean clothes. Put a smile on your face. Ask others around the dinner table about their day. If you have this way about you, your actions can naturally follow your attitude. Sacrifice quietly. Contentment will be your reward. Whatever it is you want, you want. Your attitude is your attitude. You have a choice. If you desire to be revered by others, being seen and heard will be your focus. If you desire to build character, concentrate on your private inward way of being. You can't have it both ways. You can't be content while seeking human recognition. So why worry about your reputation or the necessities of life? Look at all the produce around us. We're never going to starve as long as we love each other. 
when this old shirt of mine is about worn out, if I can't afford another, somebody with this way about them will give me one of theirs. Inside of us is a way to be that makes us more content and less worried. Each day has a new set of problems. Be patient. Our problems are solved through one another. Put your mind on improving yourself inside and let others do the same for themselves. Complaining about someone else is not going to make you more content. Neither will you be content by trying to make your point with those you already know disagree with you. Don't start arguments. Be content to tend to yourself. So when you need something, there are others with this way about them. They'll give to you what you look for. They'll help you find. The opportunities you need will be provided to you. You be this way and do the same for others. Just ask yourself what you wish were true about others and make it generally true about you for them. Now, not many will go this way. Most will find this way requires too much self-discipline. Look at the produce all around us here in the market. It's easy to see which fruit or vegetable is which, isn't it? We can tell by the color, the shape, the size, and even the smell. You folks raised in town, you might not have been able to tell one from the other when this same produce was just green shoots coming out of the ground. Eventually, though, the color and shape form, and you know, over time, things ripen. Eventually, anyone can tell what's edible and what's not. Religion is like that. When things mature over time, we discover what is really there. When all is said and done, many will say, Was I not religious? Did I not repeat the liturgy one day every week? Did I not give my money? Was I not there on work day? They never had this way about them. They just wanted to be seen and heard by their friends who were also religious. So we all have a choice about our lives. You want a more resilient life? Those who can accept this way will be able to find contentment in easy times and in hard times. Those who cannot accept this way will perceive life very differently. For those who are not able to be this way, well, when times are not great, contentment will be tough to find. With these last few words, he was finished speaking. He pressed his palms against the hay, lifting himself to his feet. Then he pulled himself into his truck and drove away. Silence in the market gave way to a growing murmur. They were amazed at what he had to say. He spoke to them as if he knew what he was talking about, but not in the way their religious leaders claimed to know. The young farmer, Tuck, made sense. What you've just heard was a parody of the so-named Sermon on the Mount. Could life be so simple? The contiguous line of thought of an ancient speaker reportedly named Jesus appears to say yes. Life is just that simple. Whether the speaker was a historical person or some imagined character in ancient literature, it is this contiguous line of thought that concerns us here. The story of the ancient speaker is not supernatural, but what it teaches about life and about being is still naturally super today. And so the Sermon on the Hay is the Sermon on the Mount told by someone who, took, who left all of the supernatural at home and who just decided to say um, Jesus' contiguous line of thought. In other words, what Jesus taught us, and my grandparents taught me that. That's where I remember learning that stuff. But I learned the stuff about how to be. I didn't learn that, um, you know, if, if you just really concentrate on this, you could walk on water too. <laughs> you know, I never learned that. And nobody even tried to teach me that. What they did it try to... It was mentioned. What, if we had enough faith, we could move mountains. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. They, that's sort of a, um, a play on a verse, on a, on a snippet. Uh, and that's one of the things that we have. We have, we have a religion built upon buzzwords and Sunday school sound bites, Christian cliches and snippets. And as you called it one day, clip art. Yeah. The, the, whole, the whole Christian religion is made up out of clip art. So I, you know, that, is it possible <laughs> that Jesus was a simple man with a well-articulated... Do I say yes? <laughs> no. Yes. I don't care what you say. <laughs> but is it possible... You don't care what I say. <laughs> is it possible that Jesus was a simple man with a well-articulated message 
about how to build a better life, and it developed a group of people known as People of the Way. And there was nothing supernatural about him or his message. In other words, and what I like to say is nothing supernatural about it. It was naturally super. And the people who have tried it, including in this century, including this year, if people who try it realize it calms you down, it causes you to be able to live life with all the crap that goes on and everything, and be able to get through life without feeling um, so beaten down and so threatened and so horrified by life, and without having this visceral response to the world that's ugly. In other words, that I'm angry, I'm I'm vengeful, I'm, uh, you know, whatever it is. But I'm you, unforgiving. Yeah, I'm unforgiving. Um, instead, you say to yourself, you know, people are, people are, you know. That's it. People are the way they are. And, and everybody has a way. And they are in charge of it. Your attitude is your attitude. That's what I say about driving in the car. Anybody that doesn't do what I want them to do, they must be handicapped. And I have to have compassion for <laughs> Yeah, I've ridden with you. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> have you got time to hear two stories in three minutes? If you are an atheist, you probably won't like the first one. If you're a theist, you probably won't like the second one. The Christian story goes like this. The one and only God made everything and everyone. The first pair of humans were named Adam and Eve. They disobeyed God and triggered a bad thing called sin. So many years later, God made a deal with a man named Abraham to found a great nation. This nation would yield a Messiah via a supernatural birth to a virgin mother. Christians call that Messiah Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus performed many miracles, like walking on water. He voluntarily sacrificed himself to being tortured to death. This created a pardon for that bad thing called sin. Then Jesus came back to life. He visited folks for 40 days before going up to a place called heaven. He promised his believers they could join him there. One day he will return to grant his promised pardons to his believers, and they will go to heaven too. But non-believers will not be pardoned. They will be punished for that bad thing called sin and granted eternal torment. And that's called the gospel, the good news, the Christian story. But then there was another story. There was a big bang. Then billions of years later, there was a simple man. He went around teaching others the way to be in life. His following developed and grew. He warned them about practicing religion in front of one another. His warnings were becoming effective. People began to feel free from religion. Religion became very angry. Finally, religion said enough is enough. He was arrested and killed. After his death, some religious leaders could see the brand equity and what he had been doing. So they hijacked his reputation and his following and continued with their lucrative guilt-based religion, only this time with him as the poster child. After hundreds of years, religion published a book with three-quarter of a million words. Only 5% were attributed to this simple man. These few words were grossly embellished into a supernatural legend. For the one who obeyed the tenets of religion, these religious leaders promised a wealthy afterlife. The obedient would live in a mansion on a golden street alongside their demised relatives. But if one could not believe the book, walk the walk and talk the talk, they would die, only to be tormented forever. This is the simple story of a simple man punished for exposing the fallacies of religion while teaching the way of humility gentleness, mercy, peace, and love. His simple line of thought became a needle in a haystack. It remains so until this day. Today, Christians dream of a wonderful life after death. Yet the ancient speaker spoke of a wonderful life while one actually lives. There was nothing supernatural about him. His teachings were just naturally super. The books behind me are all Christian references. I purchased most of them while earning a Master's of Divinity at Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. I served as a pastor in Indiana, Tennessee, 
Massachusetts, and Florida. After seeing religion up close and personal, I have something I need to tell you. It's amazing how many people I've run across in my lifetime, especially while pastoring, that say, I, I, I believe in Jesus. I think Jesus is, is an important um, figure in history. I think Jesus is, is someone worth listening to, and I try to fashion my life around that, what he taught. But I don't, a lot of this supernatural stuff, I just can't wrap my mind around. And people would be surprised how many people will admit that to a receptive pastor. That is a pastor who wouldn't criticize you or judge you for saying that. I'm telling you the blasphemy. Right, and I've never judged anyone or criticized them for saying that, going all the way back. Um, I just never did. And I never had did appreciate the, the negative words that people had to say uh, for the people outside the church. Um, the talk about gay people on Sunday morning, um, if Jesus is to be believed, believed in a supernatural sense and we're going to pay for all of those every foul word that came out of our mouths then a large portion of the christian population is going to live in some kind of purgatory where they have to sit and play cards with gay people um you know and serve them lunch um, i mean it's 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 over the top ridiculous when you think about it when you talk about you know what it is you believe jesus was all about and then you could hear yourself um, speaking in a tight circle in a closed situation with other Christian friends about people outside of the Christian community and what you think about them. Um, how could it more violate what Jesus taught about um, uh, being judged by the same measure with which you judge? Yeah. You know, how could it be more less like walking the extra mile or turning the other cheek you know how could it be more less like uh serving those who abuse you um and and um, um loving those who criticize you i mean how could it be how could it be further away from the main teachings of jesus that all of christianity touts um is acted out in reverse daily right so how can we, how can we possibly then say that we are some kind of elevated, exclusive people, that we are the ones who are saved? We are the elect, to put it in, in uh, religious terms. We are the elect. We're the ones going to heaven. That uh, Christ came to pick us out and made us the elect, and we are to care for one another, and we are to to enjoy the riches and the spoils of a great afterlife after we die, and all these other people who are not the elect uh, will be going to uh, eternal torment. Um, I, don't, I don't know how you can get there. I, I don't know how you can get there at all. And it's almost as if the church lives out the gospel in reverse. You want to go? Yeah. You want to? You want to go? You want to go for a walk, huh? Do you? Yeah.